Gospel of John. Jesus said, Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and abandoned. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved, and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Good evening. Welcome to St. Andrew's Chapel. In this week's gospel lesson that John Meeks just read, Jesus provides a figure of speech to explain who he is. He describes a sheepfold, which is a small enclosure with only one narrow gate to keep the, sa the, the sheep safe inside. The disciples don't understand what he's saying in this figure of speech. So Jesus elaborates. Very truly, I tell you, Jesus says, I am the gate for the sheep. Jesus later goes on to talk about the good shepherd, but it is significant that he begins this figure of speech by talking about himself as the gate, not simply as the shepherd or even the sheepfold itself. Positioning himself as the gate in this sheep enclosure might seem odd, but the function of the gate is to provide access to the sheepfold. So Jesus is saying that he is that which gives access to life. Too often we comprehend God to be a destination. The judge who awaits us or the ruler of some distant place, a paradise, heaven. But Jesus is suggesting that God is equally understood to be the entrance or the pathway to our destination. Now this understanding of God cuts against the secular mindset of progress that dominates our lives, irrespective of whether or not that progress is characterized as traditional or progressive. We are programmed by the world to think of happiness as an end goal, a destination, rather than it being a process a way of being, a gate. The great temptation of high school is to think that college, a destination, will bring happiness. And then the great temptation of college is to think that the real world, a destination after college, will bring happiness. Of course, by the real world, we are indicating that stage of life in which we make money, earn a paycheck. This is the myth of progress that somehow the end goal, the destination of our fulfillment is somewhere in the future and we are heading to it. It's not now, but it will come. Jesus does not say that he is a singular destination. He says that he is the entrance, the gateway to life itself. Let me provide you with one concrete example of how this conception of God as a destination can be problematic and instead thinking of it as a process, opens us up to the presence of God in our life. My father-in-law, Mrs. Montgomery's father, was also, like my wife, a high school math teacher and soccer coach. And he often remembers a time when Mrs. Montgomery and her two siblings were children. And he had to take care of them on the weekends because Mrs. Montgomery's mother served as a nurse in Atlanta's Children's Hospital. So my father-in-law taught long hours and then coached after school during the week. And then on the weekends, he looked after all three of his children by himself. And he remembers thinking to himself at the time, and I quote, that he was the most put-upon man in America. At that time, he harbored, he harbored some sense of longing for a future destination that might bring him some peace and happiness. Now, my father-in-law has just entered retirement. 
And he finally has reached a stage in his life in which he has all kinds of time to do the sorts of things that he wished he'd had time to do in those earlier years. But he looks back and he reflects that those earliest years were, and I quote, some of the happiest years of his life. He simply didn't acknowledge it at the time. This is a common reality and dynamic in our lives. We spend so much time thinking about a future destination that we lose sight of the mystery of God working in our lives right now. Because God isn't simply a destination. He is the way to a destination. This is why Jesus' very first followers in Jerusalem, long before they called themselves Christians, refer to themselves as people of the way. Because they understand from the very first that the life of God was a process, a way of being, not a destination in some far-off kingdom. It was something that was caught up in the here and the now. Now, there is a secular vision of faith that understands every religion to be a different path up the same mountain towards the same truth. And the problem with this vision of faith is that it reduces truth to a destination, as if truth itself or happiness or goodness is something static and objective that we can possess. And Jesus here in this figure of speech is suggesting that ultimate truth in God is not something that we can ever reduce to a destination, a mountain in that metaphor. Because the destination is the process, and the process is the destination. I would suggest that the Woodbury Honor Code works in a similar way. There is never a point in which a Woodbury boy has arrived at being honorable in a static and objective sense. Because honor, when properly understood, is not a destination. It's not something that we own. It's not something that we can possess. Honor, like faith, is better understood in the way that Jesus is articulating it. Honor, being honorable, and being faithful are ways of being. They are processes through which we participate in truths that we can never fully objectify. We can participate in honor by living our lives in a certain way, in the same way that we can participate in the life of God by living our lives in a certain way, the way that we call faith. The good news of this vision of God is that honor and faith and truth in God become always accessible to us right now. No matter who we are, or where we are in our lives, we are invited into the way of being that Jesus shows us. He is the gate, and we are all invited to walk through it. In this sense, the abundant life that Jesus talks about is not a destination that awaits us after we have graduated from Woodbury or college or after we have suddenly earned a huge paycheck. The abundant life in God is right here and right now all around us even in the midst of COVID-19, even in the midst of tragedy and death, even in the midst of things in our lives that turn us upside down and leave us wondering what on earth is going on. Even there, the gate is accessible to us because God is a process, a process which is an end in of itself. The only question for us is whether or not we are willing to open our eyes to see that these are, and I quote, some of the happiest years of our lives. We just might not be looking with eyes to see. Amen. Please bow your heads with me in prayer. We ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. We ask your prayers for peace, goodwill among nations, and for well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for all those who are at home in the hospital suffering from the current pandemic. And to those brave men and women working on the front lines, pray for mercy. 
I ask your prayers for Rosanna Couture and Christina Jones, who enter their final days of pregnancy. And also to Donna Gravely, who is currently fighting ovarian cancer. Lord, hear the prayers of thy people and what we have asked faithfully. Grant that we may obtain effectually to the glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I now invite you to say with me, give me clean hands, clean words, and clean thoughts. Help me stand for the hard right against the easy wrong. Save me from habits of harm. Teach me to work as hard and play as fair in thy sight alone as if the whole world saw. Forgive me when I am unkind and help me to forgive those who are unkind to me. Keep me ready to help others at some cost to myself and send me chances to do a little good every day and so grow more like Christ. Amen.